Welcome to our Wednesday night service. Let's start singing. Ben for bringing me a paper. I was, I don't know what I did with it, but anyways, let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for, uh, for this evening that we get to be gathered together. Thank you, Lord, for these songs that we're able to sing. Thank you, Lord, for that last one that reminds us that God will take care of us. Thank you, Lord, that as he takes care of the lilies and the sparrows, he reminds us that we're far more valuable than them, and he'll take care of us. We thank you, Lord, for, our heaven, for that you're our Heavenly Father, and that you take care of us day by day. Pray that now prepare our hearts for thy word, and I pray that we'll just have a wonderful time in thy house. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. For your announcements this evening, just a reminder that tomorrow, tomorrow morning, um, is the burial for Brother Dan. So at Mount Hermon Cemetery, it's in, uh, it's in Dartmouth, right on the corner of Victoria and Nantucket. So you cross the bridge and... Victoria, you go up, you up Nantucket, and then Victoria, you turn left. I think you turn left on Victoria, and the entrance is right there. 
and that's Mount Hermon Cemetery. And it's tomorrow at 11 o'clock in the morning, and it's in Section G of the, of the graveyard. So for our, our memorial, or for our graveside service of Brother Dan, we'll have a memorial service um, when his sister is able to come. So his sister is planning to come, uh, hopefully by, uh, she said, end of August or early September is her plan. So whenever that works, we will have the mem- uh, a service in the church for Brother Dan. All right, let's uh, take our, hymn, our Bibles and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And when you find your spot, we'll stand for the reading of God's Word in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to start our reading in verse number 16. First Corinthians chapter 11, let's read verse 1 just to but only verse 1, just to kind of set the stage of what he's about to say. It's like verse 1 set the stage, and then he went into what we saw last week uh, in verses 2 to 15, and then he comes back to it again in verse 16. So verse 1 we read, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. And he says, I say again in verse 16, first, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 16, Let no man think me a fool if otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly, in this confidence of boasting, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. For ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, If a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face, I speak as concerning reproach as though we had been weak. Howbeit, wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they the ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labors more abundant in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by he, the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas the king kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me, and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. Let's ask the Lord to bless the reading of his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for these verses that we're looking at this evening. Lord, these are um, some of the most well-known verses in the Bible as we look at what Paul endured for the Savior. And yet, Lord, uh, there's verses that very few of us can relate to when we think of what he was willing to do what he was willing to put himself through for his Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that as we consider it tonight, I pray, Lord, that you'll affect our hearts, Lord, to um, see, the, see our Savior as, um, as worthy of us giving him our lives, Lord, and living our lives for him. 
And I pray, Lord, that um, we will then be willing to enter the, the spiritual battle and uh, do battle with, uh, with the enemy, Lord, and fight for the truth. In Jesus' name I pray. And I pray, Lord, that you'll fill me with the Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Today's Canada Day, and uh, Canada Day is one of my favorite days of the year. I have some good memories of Canada Day when I was a kid uh, going with the young peoples, and uh, I think Mary's the only one of the young peoples representative here of who were the young peoples were when I was a kid, but uh, the young peoples would all go out to Kajimakuji every Canada Day, and uh, we'd go with them, I, me and my brothers, we'd just tag along, you know, and, uh, and uh, my mother would bring us out, and uh, we'd go kayaking, and uh, biking, and we'd get into water fights, and all those good times, and I, I like Canada Day, I, I got good memories of it. And I hope that uh, my kids will like it like I liked it. But um, on Canada Day, one of the things we do is we reflect on our country. And uh, we're thankful for the freedom that we enjoy. The freedom to move about freely, uh, usually. Uh, The freedom to earn a living. The freedom to worship. And uh, you like to remember the ones who fought for that freedom, right? You remember the ones that... Uh, lay down their lives or are serving in, that, in the military uh, realm to protect the freedoms that we enjoy here in Canada. And uh, we're thankful for those ones that went on before and are still serving. But tonight, as we look to the Word of God, we're reminded of a different kind of hero, a different kind of warrior. Not the physical warrior who fought for his country, But tonight we see the spiritual warrior, the man that stood in the battle and fought for a church, fought for a church and defended it. He was the Shamgar in the Old Testament who saw the field of beans and stood in the middle of it and his hand claved to his sword and he wouldn't give up defending that field. You say, what's the field of beans? The field of beans is the Corinthian church. It's a little bit more valuable than a field of beans, I know. But Paul is that warrior who's standing there and won't let the enemy pass. Won't let the enemy claim that field of beans. We've been going through this book and we've seen how uh, as we enter chapter 10 is when we notice that Paul is now addressing the adversaries. The enemy is there and they're attacking the Corinthian church and They didn't seem to realize it. The enemy, as we saw last week, he's come in as an angel of light and is infiltrating the church and trying to bring them into bondage, trying to take away the liberty that they have in Christ. This soldier, this battle-tested soldier in the army of the Lord, this veteran wasn't going to stand by and let it happen. And so tonight, when you look at this passage of Scripture, what you see is Paul, Paul the aged, battle-scarred, wounded, had gone through so much in the battle for the Lord, getting up out of those trenches and marching into the battlefield to do battle with the enemy that has come into the Corinthian church and trying to bring them into, liber- into bondage. He's protecting their freedom that they have in Christ. Now, aren't you glad that somebody was willing to stand in the gap and fend off the enemy? Aren't you glad that somebody didn't just say, oh, there goes another church. There goes another one that's going the wrong way. Aren't you glad that somebody didn't just say, oh, there goes another believer going after a false doctrine. There goes another one. But instead, they were willing to go after them. Go after them and stand in the gap and stand for the truth and defend the faith once delivered to the saints. And so that's what Paul is doing here tonight. And uh, he loved these Corinthians. And in the beginning of our chapter, chapter 11, he says in verse 1, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. And in these verses, starting at verse 16, he begins to talk about himself. And he describes the way he's talking as foolish talking, you know. He's talking foolishly. He's talking about boasting in things that he himself knows he should never boast of. You know what I mean? We should never boast. We should never boast of self. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross 
of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul knew that better, better than anyone. And so he understood that there was nothing that he had to boast of. The only thing he'd boast of, he says, is it, glory. If I have to glory, I'll glory in my infirmities. That's what I'll glory in. Because when I'm weak, that's when I am strong. But he's talking about boasting in things that he should never boast of because he must present his case. Not for the sake of Paul, but for the sake of Christ. He's got to go to bat against these false teachers that have come to Corinth. He has to put them, they put themselves on a pedestal. They've declared themselves to be the authoritative teachers sent from God. And Paul's got to face the adversary. He's got to stand up to these false apostles and defend his ministry for Christ in order so that he can lead the Corinthians down the right path. And so tonight we get a rare treat from our perspective. We see Paul open up a bit about his ministry. Things that in Acts, it just says it in two lines, you know, and Paul went from Philippi and went to, where did he go next? Uh, was it Berea? <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, at the, uh, at the, I don't know what those places are. I should have said one I know. When he went from Berea, he went to Thessalonica. Or no, Thessalonica, he went to Berea. <laughs> but it, it, the Bible just says he went from here to there. Paul tells you here a bit about what happened on that journey. But what happened as he did the little things that you don't even think about as he was the apostle of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so much is here, so much more that you, than when you just read the book of Acts. You see what Paul has done for the Savior. And the emphasis I want to put on this text tonight is that Paul was a preacher with a battle-tested heart. His heart for Christ had proven true in the midst of the battle. One commentator put it, this is the most compact summary that we have of Paul, the battle-scarred warrior of the cross of Christ. And so consider his battle-tested heart this evening. And I just got two main points, so uh, we'll see how we go. Uh, but number one, when you think of Paul tonight as that battle-tested warrior, think number one of his willingness to fight his willingness to fight, to get into the battle. On Sunday night, we saw Joash, and one thing we saw that Joash wasn't really ready to get into the battle, you know? He only smote three arrows. He was a bit hesitant about it. Not really ready to just jump in there and fight the good fight of faith. But Paul was ready to fight. He was willing to fight for the faith. You see, big letter A here, his willingness to engage in the fight. His willingness to engage in the fight. Look at verse 16. I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly, in this confidence of boasting, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. Remember, big letter A here, he was willing to engage in the fight. We saw this last week in chapter 11, verses 1 to 15 that Paul saw this as a spiritual battle. He understood that on the other side, it wasn't just man, it was the devil himself. The devil, as an angel of light, had infiltrated this Corinthian church, and, he, and the battle was on. And Paul wasn't about to turn away from it. He was hopping right in. He was willing to fight. And I see that as I consider how he called himself a fool. He knew that he had nothing to boast about. Paul was the one who said to these Corinthians, by the grace of God, I am what I am. He knew that he had nothing to brag about, and yet he still has to get into the fight, even though it made him feel a bit uncomfortable, perhaps. In an effort to fight off the invasion, he has to start, start get into this encounter with these ones that were glorying in the flesh. So he's willing to engage in the fight. Then big letter B here, he was willing to denounce the enemy. Willing to denounce the enemy. Uh, verse 19, For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. For ye suffer, if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. You see in these verses that Paul says that in their wisdom, They've received fools, and they've received them gladly. 
And it doesn't sound like they were very wise, does it? And this is what these fools are doing, Paul says. They're bringing you into bondage. You're free in Christ. You have Christian liberty. You have liberty from the law. You're saved from the law. But now they're bringing you back into the bondage of the law. They're devouring you. They're, they're using you for their own profit. These ones that have come in, Paul wasn't afraid to say, they're not interested in you. They're interested in themselves. They're only interested in the I, the big I. They don't care about you. They're devouring you for their own good. They're taking of you. Remember, Paul, he wouldn't take their money. But these guys, they were all about the money. They expected the money. And apparently, and then it says there, that they were uh, exalting himself. They were exalting themselves, of course, bragging about themselves. And then it says that they, might have, they were even smiting them on the face, it looks like, right? You'll receive a man if he smites you on the face. Can you imagine that? A preacher that thought he had so much authority that if you didn't obey him, he could just hit you. <laughs> it doesn't, that seems a little violent to me. I don't know it. I've never seen it before, but I've heard crazy stories. So. <laughs> so these ones, it sounds like if they got, if you didn't follow these authoritative teachers that came to Corinth, it just sounds like they got angry, doesn't it? Have you heard of someone that got angry if someone just didn't do it exactly how they wanted it to be done? Got angry if you just didn't follow them exactly as they thought you should? And uh, that's how these ones were in Corinth. And even to the point where perhaps they had smitten some on the face. Paul doesn't say that they had necessarily, but he says it, that you'd receive them if they did. <laughs> you know, that's how, that's how far you've gone down this path. And Paul wasn't afraid to hide. Hi, hi, Paul wasn't afraid to state, you know, what was going on there. You know, he wasn't afraid to say, look, this, is, this isn't right. This isn't something that you should have in your church. This isn't something that you should accept as normal. And he denounces the enemy and denounces what they were doing and how they were treating the people in the church. And then we see, big letter C here, that Paul was willing to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. I know you could say head-to-head, -head, but I like toe-to-toe. -to -toe. You know, you stand toe-to-toe -to -toe and you, you get into it. And uh, Paul, he wasn't afraid to, to go right up to them and fight the fight. He says in verse 21, I speak as concerning reproach as though we had been weak. That's what they were saying. Paul is weak. Paul, Paul can't stand up for himself. Paul doesn't have any authority. He's a weak man. Because they remember they thought his meekness was weakness. But Paul says, How be it, wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. Hey, they say, they say they're bold. They say we're weak. They, they, preach, uh, they, they say that they, they talk of us as if we got no strength, spiritual strength. Paul says, I, if anybody's bold, I'm bolder than them. I'm as bold as them. Nobody's more bold than me. Nobody's as powerful as me. I'm a warrior. Let, it's like he's a, someone that's just being held back almost, you know, and he's just saying, let me at him. Let me at him. I, I got to get him. And uh, he was willing to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Are they Hebrews? Paul, yeah, of course Paul's a Hebrew. He's, an, he's of the seed of Abraham. He's not going to back down from them. He's going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemy. You know, in the in the physical realm, guys are always willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with each other, aren't they? I, uh, I want to actually press him back there. I want to have a race with Preston. Because uh, it was said on a Sunday morning that uh, Preston was the fastest man in the room. Meet me at 3 o'clock at the flagpole after school, Preston. I'll show you who's the fastest man. <laughs> I'm a little competitive. It's a... It's not good. Just not long distance, though, because I can't do that anymore. <laughs> but, <laughs> but a sprint. <laughs> but, you know, guys, we, uh, we, like to, uh, we like to brag about how strong we are, how fast we are, how well we can play, use a hockey stick or whatever, you know. We want to brag about that stuff. And people can get that way. Nobody can stand in my way. And 
let's be honest, when guys talk that way or when people talk that way to everyone else, it just sounds foolish, doesn't it? It sounds silly. Like, what's, what's the point of that? And Paul admittedly is like, this isn't, I don't, I don't feel good talking this way. I'm talking foolishly here. I realize how it sounds, but I've got to get in this fight. I've got to defend this church. I've got to defend that field of beans. I've got to stand for the truth, for the faith once delivered to the saints. And so he's the hero. He's the soldier who wouldn't let that church be overcome by the devil. He was willing to get in the fight. And I wonder today, what about us today? Are we willing to get in the fight? Are we willing to get involved? I realize that Paul had a responsibility to the Corinthians. And preachers have responsibilities to their churches. And uh, we have responsibility one for another. And Paul is the hero here. He's the soldier who wouldn't let that church just be gone to the devil. He had a willingness to fight. And he'd do anything for them. And so easy, you know, just to watch others be led astray, isn't it? So easy just to lift up our hands and say, there goes another one. There goes another Christian down a wrong path. There goes another one. But it takes the heart of a warrior, the Christian who is engaged in the fight to say, hey, that's not right. Come back to the Bible, back to the Word of God, back to the fundamentals of the faith, back to the faith once delivered to the saints. So are you willing to fight for the ones you love? Paul was willing to fight for this church in Corinth. And he was willing to do more than that, you know. He shows, secondly, not just a willingness to fight, but number two, he also had a willingness to suffer. A willingness to suffer. He was willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. He was willing to suffer for the sake of those who were under his care. In big letter A there, he has got the scars to prove it. He's got the scars to prove it. You know, guys will often, they'll, they'll talk, and I don't know why I say guys, I guess because I'm, I'm a guy, and I, I've been there and done that, you know? You talk, and you brag about, you know, oh, did you see, we were playing a hockey game, and did you see my shot there? Or my wife and I, she gets really fed up with me, because after we go, like, to a friend's house, and we play a game or something, and, my wife, and I say to my wife on the way home, did you see what I did? Did you see what? Didn't I play a great game? Didn't I just do so good there? And uh, we talk about how good we did, right? Because that's our pride within us, right? But uh, there, was a, uh, there was a man, but the, he, sometimes guys can do it the other way, can't they? Sometimes a guy can, instead of talking about what, he's, uh, what good things he's done, sometimes they go and they, they show off their scars, you know? They show off their battle wounds. They show off, uh, you know, when I, was a, when I was a kid, I was playing street hockey, and uh, I was playing goalie, and I, was, and I was a little bit silly. I didn't want to wear the face mask, right? So uh, we were just playing ball hockey, so all we're using is a ball or a plastic puck. But then out comes this real puck on wheels. And uh, my brother's friend, who's the Mountie that we were playing for, he... Uh, he, he takes a shot, and he was always bigger and stronger than the rest of the kids on the street. And he gets me right, I think it was this eye right here. I don't know which one it was right off my memory, but if you look closely, I have a little scar, you know, a little scar. And I, when my kids talk about scars, I always show them my, my little scar in my eye, you know, and say, look, that's what I got, you know. And uh, we can sometimes talk about our scars. Well, Paul, in our text... He's not talking about the good things he's done. He's talking about his scars. He's talking about what he suffered for the Lord. Talking about the things that he's endured as a Christian. And we see Paul here showing that, to talking to these false teachers, he's showing them that he's not going anywhere. Paul isn't about to up and leave the fight. He's already endured all of this. He can take a little squabble with these false teachers that have come to Corinth. They're not going to just get Paul out of the way. And uh, you see his willingness to suffer in these verses. First of all, in verse, or as you look at verse 23, he speaks of his labors. Are they ministers of Christ? 
Paul says, I am more in labors, more abundant. These guys, they just came to a church that Paul had literally gone to where a city where there's no churches and Paul, by the power of the Spirit, saw a church started there in Corinth. These guys don't have any labors to speak of that are claiming this authority. He's in labors more abundant. Then he says, in stripes above measure. Do you realize that Paul had received more stripes as a preacher than he cared to count? They were above measure. He was thrown in prison frequently, he says next. He says, in stripes beyond measure. And then he says, in prisons more frequent. And I think, you know, I read the Bible, the New Testament, book of Acts, and I read about Paul's ministry, and I see him in prison in Philippi, and then I don't see him in prison again until near the end. And I know that Corinth was written, the letters to Corinth were written before the second imprisonment. And so all we read in Acts up to that point is that he was in the Philippian jail. But as you read this, you realize that wasn't an odd thing that happened for Paul. He was in prisons often, more frequent, he says. He was there more than just that time, and we don't know how many times it was. He says in deaths, oft. You know, sometimes you say, I'm scared to death. <laughs> I'm just, it's just a, such a terrifying scene what I'm in right now. Well, friend, you wouldn't want to walk a day with the Apostle Paul because he was often in that place where you'd be scared to death. And death off, where it was where David said to Jonathan, There's but a step between me and death. Paul experienced that often, he says in the text. Verse 24 Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. The Jews had a law where they could beat a man with, give him stripes 39 times, 39 stripes per time. They couldn't give him 40 stripes. So, five times they had given Paul. 39 stripes. No wonder he lost count because that's not even all the stripes that he's received. And he says in, in uh, verse 25, thrice was I beaten with rods. So he's beaten with rods three times that he, up to this point in his ministry. This is still long before the end. And then he says, once was I stoned. And that's told for us in Acts chapter 14 when he was in Lystra and they first worshipped him as a god, and the next they're casting stones at him. And uh, he was stoned there in Lystra and left for dead. And then thrice, he says, I suffered shipwreck. And a night and a day have I been in the deep. And once again, the shipwreck that we read in the book of Acts is well after he wrote First Corinthians. The shipwreck that's there is in Acts 27, when he's on his way to Rome as a, as, a soul, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a prisoner. But here he mentions three times that he's already been shipwrecked. And once, he's, all, he's spent the, night, the day and the night in the deep. And the picture there is of Paul literally on the ship's broken down. And Paul's on a drifting plank off in the sea, just holding on for dear life for a day and a night until he's able to be rescued. And, you know, all the Bible says is he went from here to there. <laughs> doesn't say that, oh, along the way he got shipwrecked. Along the way, he, this happened to him. And uh, Paul tells us here about his shipwrecks. Then he says he was in journeyings oft in verse 26, in perils of waters, as he just described. Another thing you don't think of as you journey in those days is the robbers, the robbers that lurked everywhere. And he says he was in perils of robbers. You read the story of the Good Samaritan and how that man was walking from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. That was a more common experience back then. That was something that happened more often than you care to think. And Paul was often in perils of robbers. He says, in perils by mine own countrymen. Acts will tell you about times when the Jews wanted to stone him or wanted to, were persecuting him because of his faith. In perils by the heathen, so even the Gentiles persecuted him. In perils in the city, yeah, you saw those in places, but then also in perils in the wilderness 
and in perils in the sea. It wasn't a place that Paul went to where he was ever really, you know, from a physical perspective, safe. Trouble could come up to Paul anywhere. And he says, in perils among false brethren. And uh, these are the ones he's dealing with now. And he says, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in watching, you know, just, I, I picture it as someone that's staying up all night to make sure the stuff's okay, you know? Just staying up all night to make sure that nothing happens until the morning to, so that he can sound a call, you know? And he was in hunger and thirst and fastings often. And this doesn't, this verse isn't talking about times when you purposely fast. This is, he just didn't have the food or the bread that he needed. He was hungry and thirsty and fasting. And then in cold and nakedness. And you remember how in 2 Timothy, this is after Corinth is written as well, when he's in prison for the last time, and he asks, uh, he asks Timothy to, to bring him his coat and, uh, because he was cold in the prison. And uh, Paul suffered a lot for the Savior. He went through some, some tough times. Why? in order to preach the gospel. No wonder he, he had the scars of a warrior. No wonder he could say to the Galatians, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. The marks, speaking of the marks of the cross, the scars of our Savior. And Paul said, I, I have those too. I've suffered for him. And uh, reading of an apostle like Paul, it, it ought to impress on us not to become comfortable as a Christian. We expect the comforts, don't we? We expect the luxuries of life. We expect to have, have it all, and if we don't have it all, we think that obviously God didn't lead that way or something. And we complain so easily. We give up so easily. We reach our limits so easily. But Paul was willing to do anything for the Savior. He was willing to suffer. And uh, are you willing? Am I willing? Paul had the scars to prove his love. And then number two, or big letter B, he's got the heart to prove it. He's got the heart to prove it. It says in verse 28, Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? I believe now he's speaking of you know, something that's even bigger than a bigger burden on him than everything he's mentioned already. Something that weighs on him more than that. Every day, it's the care of all the churches. Paul's heart was with the churches. Every day, he is concerned for these churches. They give him joy. And some days, they give him grief and stress. In trouble, he's always feeling the weight, not just of a church, but the weight of the churches. So many churches that God had led him to. So many churches that he had planted in Galatia. You read the book of Galatians, and that's not written just to one church. That's written to the churches in Galatia, in that whole region. The churches of Macedonia, there are at least three the churches in Achaia, at least Corinth, and other places that Paul went to with the gospel. And he was personally burdened for each and every one of them. When they were weak, he was weak. When, he was, when they were offended, he burned. He suffered too. He felt their pain. His heart was there for these churches. And here these ones were trying to get Paul out of the way. <laughs> they were trying to get Paul to forget his flock. Yeah, good luck with that. Good luck getting a, a man like Paul, a soldier like him, to stop caring for the Corinthian church. Paul wasn't going to go anywhere. He was the hero of the war, standing up to the enemy, defending this church that he loved. He was willing to suffer for them. He had the heart to prove it. And then last of all this evening, he's got the faith to prove it. He's got the faith to prove it. Verse 30 to 33. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. He's just gone through all 
his infirmities here in the text. And uh, he's not glorying in successes and all those things. And he says, The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. And he says in this, in verse 32, In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king, kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me. And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. What's Paul talking about right here? This is the very first one. This was way back at the beginning. When Paul got saved on the Damascus road, he was on his way to Damascus to persecute the church. And instead he saw the Savior, saw him in his glory, and he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And he became a disciple of the Lord. He was a Christian and, and, and trusted the Lord as a Savior and started living his life for the glory of God. And he kept going on his way to Damascus. And what he did at Damascus was then he started to, he, he started preaching the word. He started telling everyone around him about the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the point where now he was the one that was being persecuted. Now he was the one that they didn't want around. He, they, had, they, they, were made, they were upset with Paul for his stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the very beginning of his ministry, they were watching the city gates to make sure that Paul didn't escape. And he had to escape through the window of the wall down through a basket. And I believe Paul is referring back to that time now as he's saying, look, I learned way back then. I learned way back then to trust the Lord. I learned way back then that as a Christian, I'm going to have hard times. As a Christian, I will suffer. But I learned back then that I could trust my Heavenly Father to see me through. Friend, have you learned that? Are you trusting the Savior today? Paul says, you can oppose me, you can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with me, but I know my Father. He'll see me through, just like he has all these times in the past. And I'm not going anywhere. I'm willing to do anything for the cause of Christ. And Paul was the hero, you know. He was the soldier in the army. He wasn't backing down. He wasn't afraid to stand his ground. He was willing to suffer, willing to fight for the church and for the cause of Christ. And what about us today? What about you? What about me? Are you willing to get in the fight? Paul ended, the, Paul ended the, uh, his life and was able to say, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Paul was the soldier who passed the test, and at the end of it, there was a crown waiting for him in glory. Friend, are you going to fight the fight? Are you looking forward to... To, to, are you looking forward to seeing the Savior face to face? You'll want to give him a crown that day, won't you? And Paul knew, because he had finished that fight, that that crown was laid up for him in heaven. And uh, friend, don't, don't let the devil, don't just let the devil win around. Grab your sword and get in that field of beans and take your stand and fight for your king. Will you do that today? Let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for the time we've had in your word tonight. Pray, Lord, that now you bless it to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.